if you had to ask me off the top of my head, what are three of the most distinctive ways that Christians can live? And by that, I mean like live our lives in ways that are so different to the world around us um, that gives a, a kind of a positive image of Christianity. I would say those three things are number one, to live with humility. So in a world just filled with hubris, to live with humility. Number two, hope. As you know, just all the anxiety and discouragement around us to live with hope is distinctive. And then number three, I would say, is generosity. Uh, just in a culture that is so materialistic, has always been that way, but especially now with kind of the economic circumstances and fear and kind of lockdown and hoarding mentality, generosity will shine like a light and I believe really break down walls uh, for those not yet in the kingdom uh, to see the goodness of the kingdom of God. And that's where we headed today, uh, talking about generosity in the first of our rule of life modules, where we are looking at six important aspects of our lives that are under particular pressure uh, from the culture around us, pressure to assimilate into the worldly ways of the culture. And so looking at six habits or rhythms to fortify and form our faith despite these pressures. And so today we kick that off by talking about money. So I'm sure a lot of you will be aware of this little interesting fact that Jesus spoke more about money than any other subject, right? More than the subject of heaven and hell combined. So about 15% of everything Jesus said was about the kind of negative pressure that money places on us. So that's about one day in a week Jesus would be teaching and speaking about Money, And I think intuitively we know that that makes sense because I think we all realize what a central role money plays in our lives. It's kind of first on the list of things that contribute to our anxiety, isn't it? If you think about our anxiety, oftentimes what's causing that is financial concern. Uh, it's first on the list of things that lead to conflict, but in marriage and in other relationships, it's first on the list of contributors to exploitation, greed, and corruption. So when the Bible warns us about the effect of money, and the Bible does warn us many times, for example, this one from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 to 11, it says, Those who long to be rich... Those who long to be rich, however, stumble into temptation and a trap and many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evils. Some people in reaching for it have strayed from the faith and stab themselves with many pains. So when the Bible warns us about this, I think we get it. We feel this pressure. We know how it can corrupt us, how it is negatively shaping us. We get it, and that's why we're here. Now, this is obviously a subject that we could talk about all week. And so what I want to do this morning is just pull out three aspects of the subject of Christians and finances that I think are going to be most helpful in contributing towards a positive rule of life when it comes to money. So the three aspects I want to talk about is duty, justice, and generosity. So when it comes to money and Christian responsibility with money, we start with duty or what is expected of us as Christians. And here we're talking about the principle of the tithe. Now, some of you might be, be aware, if you're not aware, it's a principle that basically says that we give away a percentage of all of our income directly to the work of the church. And often that percentage that is spoken about is 10%, uh, because the word tithe literally means a tenth. 
It's a principle that very much has its roots in the Old Testament. Uh, as God gathered his people at Mount Sinai and gave them the covenant, the old covenant, part of that was this principle of the tithe. Now that immediately begs a very important question for us that we have to answer today, that we always have to answer whenever we find ourselves confronted with the principle that is rooted in old covenant law. And that question is, does that still apply today? Uh, because oftentimes it does. We have the Ten Commandments that we very much live by, but then there's a whole lot of old covenant laws that Thankfully, we no longer have to abide by. For example, we may now very gratefully eat bacon. So the question is, does the principle of tithing rooted in Old Testament still apply today? Well, what many people don't realize is that this principle of tithing existed before the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. We first see it practiced by the great patriarch Abram himself, who in this kind of crazy story that I wish we could get to, where he uh, goes and rescues his nephew Lot, who in the story I think significantly is greedy and uh, gets captured. And Abram uh, amasses an army and goes and just heroically rescues his family. And they get all this plunder from that war. And Abram gives 10% of the loot from that war to a very mysterious priestly guy known as Melchizedek. In the New Testament, this priestly mysterious figure is compared to Christ or is seen as a type of Christ. And Abram gives him 10% of everything that he got in that war. And you've got to wonder, like, where did that come from? Was that like just what culture did at that time? Was that God prompting Abram himself? We don't know. After Abram comes Isaac, comes Jacob. We see Jacob at one point when he's uh, making covenant with God, giving 10% of what he has to God. Jacob becomes Israel. Hundreds of years later, Israel's gathered at Mount Sinai. And then this principle is consolidated into this law. So question still is, does that carry to the New Testament, to us today. Well, I think the fact that it preceded the law should give you a hint. And the answer is yes. And so indeed we see Jesus affirming this principle. We see the New Testament Christians practicing it. Uh, we see language of Paul in his letters affirming uh, this principle. And we'll get to some of those scriptures in a moment. But quite honestly, it just makes plain sense because just like in the Old Testament, where the temple and the sacrificial system, the worship system only existed through the personal giving of the members to the tribe of the Levites, just so today, the church can only operate, it can only function through the personal offerings of its members. That's how it was in the Old Testament, and that's how it is now. So here's one of Paul's mentions of this principle in New Testament, 1 Corinthians 9. Verse 13 to 14, he says, he reminds them about Old Testament stuff. He says, do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offering? So he's talking Old Testament times now. Then he says, in the same way, the Lord commanded now that those who proclaim the, the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So Paul's very much connecting this Old Testament principle in the temple with the ministry happening in the New Testament church. So does the principle apply today? Yes, but also no. What? Yes, but also no. No, in the fact that we are now no longer talking about, and hear me here, no longer talking about a legal obligation tied to a specific, a very specific percentage. We're no longer talking about a legal obligation tied to a specific percentage. So the verse that came up before the sermon, which we'll get to at the end as well, uh, verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 9 incredibly important verse about the New Testament principle says, 
each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And in that one little verse is like the heart of the transition, a lot of the transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament, where external legal obligation is replaced with internally motivated by the grace of God obedience, which in tithing could just be anything on the scale. So what that means for people Today, so it's internally motivated, willingly, not under compulsion, but also as they have determined. So for some people, those who have prospered greatly, 10% is far too little. So in the New Testament, for example, Zacchaeus, who Jesus calls down from the tree and he's, and he's just convicted and he repents, gives 50% of everything that he gave. You will see the, as the church started exploding, some of the people sold everything. That, that's like 100%. So to those who've prospered greatly, 10% is too little. But for those who are experiencing extreme financial difficulty, it may be too much. And 1% or 2% may be all that they can give. And that may be a lot of you, a lot of us, and I say that because we started to process the results of the survey and we're getting back with hundreds of results already. And it seems like more than half of Rosebank people have been severely negatively impacted by last year and the pandemic, losing jobs or losing income. And so the last thing that we're going to do is add to your weights this legal demand, which is no longer a legal demand. But I'll say this, Christians do, it's expected to give voluntarily to the work of a local church. And if you're looking for a place to start, 10% is a great place to start. That's why we still talk about, we still use the language of tithe today. It has this great, rich, biblical history and is a great baseline practice from which to move on. So that's where we start, the basic expectation, what's expected, our duty as Christians. But then we move on from duty to justice. So going beyond what's expected to what is right. What is right. So one of the New Testament passages that affirms the principle of tithing but takes it further comes from Jesus as he is he's, he's in a speech and he is laying into the religious leaders. Just some of his harshest words about these religious leaders and part of his judgment on them is around how they do tithing. And so this is what he says, Matthew 23, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law, that being justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Notice a couple of things here. They're tithing, these religious leaders, they're tithing to the cent. Mint and dill and cumin, it's like they are literally counting herbs, grains of salt and tithing 10%. So they are tithing, Jesus affirms that they're doing it, these things you should have done, but what he's getting at, what he's really getting at, and what I want to get at this morning is they are doing that but neglecting justice and mercy and faithfulness. So justice, social justice, such an important phrase for us today around the world. We need to understand what it means. However, it is 
such a large, complex subject that to do it justice, pun, pun intended, uh, we would really need to devote some time to it. I'm actually thinking about doing that later this year, talking about social justice. However, I, I want to try to give you enough of a glimpse of justice and social justice in the Bible, enough of a glimpse here, because when it comes to talking about Christians and money, we have to talk about, we still have to talk about the sharing of our wealth with the poor. And that is not a tithing subject. To be sure, churches will participate in ministering to the poor, but largely because they have the means to coordinate that. But the responsibility to alleviate the needs of the poor does not just belong to the church. It's not just a communal responsibility. It's a personal responsibility. And it's tied to the idea of justice. Justice. I want to try and reduce this very complex discussion to, to just giving you one idea, an idea that has been transformational to me in understanding our responsibility towards the poor. So that's all I want to do is just one truth about justice and the poor. Here it goes. Giving to the poor is not charity it's justice let me say that again giving to the poor is not charity it's justice that's just the one part of this discussion i want to bring home this morning i want to give you a brief explanation and a longer one so here's the brief explanation charity in our english usage of the word when you think about the word charity it kind of describes something that's optional you do it when you have the means to when you get around to it charity is optional uh, when charity becomes a requirement it's no longer charity is it by definition if it's required it's not charity that's how we understand the english word charity which we often associate with giving to the poor but the biblical view on giving part of our wealth in alleviating the needs of the poor is not something that's optional, that we do when we can. It's something we do because it is right to do so. That's the brief explanation. Here's the longer one. So the word justice in the Bible, in the Old Testament, is the Hebrew word mishpat, such an important word comes up hundreds of times, literally over 400 times, is tied to the very nature of God himself and how he acts. So you will have seen this in the Old Testament when God is being described. Justice is added in there. For example, Psalm 89 verse 14 says, Righteousness and justice, mishpat, are the foundation of his throne. That's how he rules, through justice. Now, Again, when we, English-speaking people, when we hear the word justice, we think legal. So we think a court, somebody did something wrong and they need to be punished. That's what we think when we hear justice. That's not wrong. Justice is not less than that, but it's far more than that. Especially in the Bible, justice is far bigger than just this legal punishment for doing something wrong. Now, if you want to understand a rich biblical word, just Bible study principle number one, look at how it's used in the Bible. And if it's used a lot, and if it's used most of those times in a certain way, you can be pretty sure what it means. When it comes to justice, 400 times usage, it is mostly staggeringly used in connection to our view of four groups of people called the quartet of the vulnerable. The quartet of the vulnerable. Justice comes up most of those times connected with how we treat four groups of people. The widows, the orphans, 
the immigrants and the poor all over. For example, you can see it there in Zechariah 7, verse 10 to 11. You can go and read it. It's all over the Bible. The quartet of the vulnerable is connected to this idea of justice, meaning the justice of a society, according to the Bible, is how we treat these people. Any neglect to show them compassion according to the Bible, is not a lack of charity. It is a violation of justice. That's how this word justice is connected. And part of it is this view of contributing to the needs of the poor. Simply, it's the right way to live. Justice or giving to the poor is not charity. It's justice. So let me give an example just real quick, I really wasn't sure to include this example because I know I'm just going to take a lot of time this morning. But it came up, this example, literally in my own private little readings on the day I was preparing. I felt like I have to acknowledge that. And maybe this will just be meaningful to a couple of you. So the prophet Jeremiah, just before the kingdom of Judah is about to get deported to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar is going to annihilate them. Jeremiah is prophesying to these people. And in one of these prophecies, Jeremiah or God is severely judging the last king, Jehoiakim, like severely judging him. And contrast Jehoiakim, this evil king, with another really good king, Josiah, happened to be his father. And this is what God says to wicked King Jehoiakim. It says, Jeremiah 22, uh, verse 15. I just love this sentence. I just, God just gets to the point sometimes. <laughs> it says to Jehoiakim, Do you think that you are a king because you compete in cedar? What he means is, like cedar, this kind of luxury wood, Jehoiakim had built this amazing palace and had tried to have more cedar than any other king just to prove, like he's the man. And God says to him, do you think you're a king? Because you're like the best at having this amazing palace. And I mean, no, that, you're not a king because of that. And then it comes the comparison did not your father, so the good guy, Josiah, did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? And then it was well with him. So the pictures of Josiah, who get this, was not an ascetic. It's not like Josiah lived in poverty. It's not like John the Baptist eating locusts and wild honey and camel skin hair. Like, did not your father uh, eat and drink? So he lived okay, but he did not neglect. What? Justice. He did what was just. Now, what does that mean? Well, verse 16. Here's what it means. We've come to learn this. You already know this now. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well. And then the sentence. This is what caught me. Is not this to know me, declares the Lord. Isn't this what it means to know me? Isn't this what it means to be a citizen of my kingdom? Isn't this what it means to be a child in my family? Isn't this what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus? Is not this what it means to live but to do what is just and right? I hope you're getting just at least just a little snapshot, a picture of this word justice and how it's connected to our alleviating the needs of the poor ourselves. Now, okay, let's try to bring this home a little bit. Because in the Rule of Life series, what we're acknowledging is, hey, there's these massive parts of our lives, money, and there's all of this going on, and you know, justice and the church, how do we think about it? And the whole point of Rule of Life is to implement some habits and rhythms that are like that trellis that just give us a structure to our lives that help us to live this way even when we don't feel like it, even when we don't want to, but is right and good. So 
I came across, like just a really simple rule of life habit when it comes to this idea of contributing or helping the poor with justice in, in, in a personal capacity that's going to be part of hopefully our rule of life, Rosebank, for 2021. Uh, and it's really, really simple, but really powerful. So here's what it could be. Something as simple as when you go to the grocery store, right, and you're busy putting stuff into your shopping cart, like all the important stuff, so bread, eggs, coffee, like those are the necessities, you put that in, then whenever you put something into your cart that's not a necessity, that, that you would consider as a luxury, you don't need that part, you start to run a tab of the luxury items. So you got the bread and the milk and the eggs and the, and the coffee, and then you put in like the lemon creams, right? which for me is more like a necessity, but you get the point. Like, this, like you put those in, you just keep a running tab of that and then simply give an equal amount of what you spent on luxury, give to somebody in need or ministering to the poor. So simple, but just think about this for a little bit with me because it's so powerful because it starts there, but you start to think in your life about everything that's luxury. Right, everything that's not need and that is beyond that. Right, so for example, it may get to a place in life where you're even considering something like going on holiday and the amount that you would spend on your holiday, you would give, like it can just blow up in your life. And here's why this is such a powerful little principle. Because if you do just that, you take the luxury amount in your card and, and you give an equal amount away. For most people, there would be a limited budget for groceries. For me, there's a very limited budget for like coffee. Like when I go to Seattle or whatever, like there's an amount. Now, if, uh, that's a luxury. And so if I'm going to give an equal amount away, that means what? It means I have to half the luxury spend in order to give an equal amount. And so what starts to happen is you start to increase in living simply. It's kind of the luxury portion comes down you start to increase in, in simplicity and increase in generosity, in giving to the poor. And I have a feeling that as we generally, guys, just step, as we generally start to live increasingly simple lives and increasingly generous lives, for me, that just sounds, man, that sounds like a new testament christians like we are just in good company as we track that out see it's just such a simple little habit that you can apply on your own i'll talk about that at the end how we're going to apply these habits but that can radically just shape the way we live as christians and ultimately this idea this is the, the real goal the real goal is generosity the real goal is going beyond what's expected and going beyond what's right. Being able to put away the calculators and be able to live in the freedom of being able to give generously. I almost see these principles, these two habits of tithing and then giving to the poor as like training wheels, you know? You put them on to learn to ride a bike, Although aside, that's not the best way to learn to ride a bike these days. But you get what I mean. You put the trainer to learn to ride the bike. Then you're going to take them off and ride freely. That's the idea here. That is the picture of New Testament Christianity is living in the freedom, the freedom of generosity. And I really mean freedom. I'm using that word carefully here. Freedom of generosity because it's counterintuitive. And the reason why we say freedom of generosity is because we're free from the goal, the ideal, the dream, is to be free from a preoccupation with material things, because we are. To be free from a preoccupation with material things and finances. I mean, it's important, it's a part of our lives, but we're preoccupied. To be free from that and free from anxiety, the heavy anxiety regarding God's provision 
in our lives. And we just, we're just really all in this together. We all feel that anxiety. And we all feel this pull. And what's put before us in the Bible is just the freedom of living without that and being able to trust God to give to us. And we do, don't we? We say those things. Trust His provision. And at the same time, we know that money has this shaping, negative shaping effect on us. The problem is actualizing this, actually experiencing it. We all know this. I'm teaching you anything you don't know, except maybe some of the things earlier. We all know this, but activating it, actualizing it in our lives, actually experiencing freedom from anxiety over finances and freedom from the idolatry of materialism. And ironically, activating this freedom happens through giving, through generosity. So I want to close by reading again that scripture that was read before the sermon. And I'm not going to comment on it. What I'm hoping is you are going to see these three principles threaded in this passage now. Duty, justice, and generosity. So let's read together again a classic passage on generosity. 2 Corinthians 9, I'm just going to read from verse 6 to 11. The point is this. Whoever sows or gives sparingly will also receive sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work, as it is written. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. So he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. And you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Lord, we gather before you this morning, our Heavenly Father, our King Jesus, the one who was, though you were rich in supreme generosity, became poor for our sake and modeled for us once and for all a life of giving away, of sacrifice. And yet we come before you as just ordinary human beings under the weight of very real anxiety over provision, especially in these times. Very real concerns for the needy around us confronted with a daily, with a knowledge of your kingdom and church and how these things work. And yet at the same time, just finding ourselves a little paralyzed when it comes to this important aspect of our lives. And I pray, Lord Jesus, this morning that your death for us and your resurrection, the supreme example of generosity, would saturate our lives. So we just confess, God, we need your help. This is not a change. We can't break free from this preoccupation. We can't break free from anxiety on our own. We need you and your grace. And yet you've promised us abundant grace in this area. So release us and free us today 
to be more concerned with you and people than things. Release us and free us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.